I was saying that uh, Khan Lions are our partners, but that's not, not the whole truth because our president, David, is the, also president of the world. And uh, also, ECO is sponsoring a significant uh, part of the world. So they're rather, and then we saw Fiorenza in the presentation. So I would state that they are our brothers and sisters rather than partners. So tomorrow at 3.30, we will see, of course, the, uh, the next presentation by the winners from Sweden. And now we had countries, we had awards, and now we bring a whole continent. So I would like to introduce Jean Leopold Schobeck, uh, the past ECO president, who will moderate one of the most interesting sessions, the Africa Continent Session. Please. Good morning. Welcome to the last session of this morning. Um, this session is about Africa, as Maxim said, and actually it's the first time that this topic in Africa is going to be covered um, at an eco-conference. Is Africa the last frontier of the PR industry is the topic we're going to debate uh, this morning. But before we get into the debate and before I present the, the panelists, I just want to share with you a few facts about Africa, just to set a scene. Africa is vast, as you know. Um, it's made of 54 countries with a population of 1.2 uh, billion uh, people. Um, interestingly, it is by far the youngest continent in the, in the world. The average age is 20 years, whereas, for instance, in Europe, it's uh, 42. It represents right now about 17% of the, 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 the global population. By 200, uh, 2050, it will be uh, a bit less than a third. It's going to be the only continent which percentage-wise is going to grow uh, in, the next, uh, in the next year. Growth figures are also impressive. Uh, growth uh, rates for Africa is expected to be about 5% this year, and that takes, of course, into, it's an average, it's taken into consideration some countries in Africa which are not growing. So it says a lot about a few of the countries which are growing extremely fast. Now, most importantly, most interestingly, six out of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world are in Africa. To debate we, uh, today and to talk about Africa, we have gathered uh, uh, a number of consultants who are from Africa and all active in Africa. I will start with uh, Nicola at, uh, at my right side. Nicola is the founder and CEO of Atmosphere in Cape Town, uh, South Africa. Um, Atmosphere is one of the most successful creative public relations agencies in South Africa. It was voted twice in a row in the last two years as the most uh, successful PR company in uh, South Africa. It was also the, one of the five finalists uh, of the best uh, agencies in Africa on the Holmes uh, report. Um, to my left, Janet Kamini. Uh, Janet, Janet is from, um, is from Leventer in Nairobi, uh, Kenya. It's a young agency, uh, very active in the corporate, uh, corporate side. And interestingly, before joining uh, and starting uh, her own agency in Kenya, which is one of the fastest growing markets in, in Africa and the hub, and she will tell you more about that, in the, uh, the hub of uh, East Africa, uh, Janet was uh, director of communication for PwC and covering East and West Africa from Nairobi. At my right side, Yomi Badejo, he's the CEO of CMC Connect in Lagos, uh, Nigeria. Uh, CMC is one of the major agencies in Nigeria. It's also the affiliate of Bursa Masteller uh, in uh, Nigeria. Importantly, uh, 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 Yomi is also the Secretary General of APRA. APRA is the African Public Relations Association. And last but not least, Nathalie Mo. Nathalie is Managing Director of Africa Practice. Africa Practice is 
the first and probably one of the only uh, firms, independent firms, covering whole of Africa. They have about 100 people, six offices across Africa, and one in London. So, first question for uh, Natalie. What are the main characteristics, uh, Natalie, uh, of the African market? Because it looks like, for us, for most of people, quite a big, homogeneous uh, continent. But I gather that, like in all other parts of the world, that's not the case. Um, thanks for the question. I think I might start by just taking us back around 10, 15 years when we first started the firm, because I think Africa's growth and evolution over that period is very much mirrored in the evolution of our own business model. And so I can explain the shift in our services in line with the continent's development, which I think will set a, a decent context for the conversation. So about 10, 15 years ago, um, people had very clear perceptions about Africa. It was not seen as a land of opportunity. It was seen as dominated by a lot of negative perceptions, which I won't get into. I think everybody understands. And we decided to, to set up the company because we felt that that wasn't an accurate um, portrayal of the reality of, of being in Africa. We felt that the private sector, and that means the African private sector as well as the international private sector, could be a force for good, um, could be instrumental in driving tax revenues and job creation, skills and knowledge transfer, and that that was the way that the continent would grow and evolve. So we set up the, the company to tell Africa's success stories at a time when people really didn't believe. So when we started, people would say, well, how do you make money? Are you really a private consultancy? Are you a charity? 10 years later, people see risk and, and return in a completely different way because we've gone through the global financial crisis. People don't see the established markets in the West um, in the same safe way that they did before. They've recognized that volatility exists just as much in those markets as it does in Africa. Um, and that the returns are in Africa. Um, You've mentioned that it's a young population, it's a huge population, and Africa's growth over the last 10 years has not been purely fueled by resources, it's also been fueled by the growth of that consumer class. And a lot of companies are, are playing in that space and, and evolving to, to serve those people's needs. In the last two years, I'd say, actually, I wonder whether we're moving out of Africa rising and into perhaps Africa unstuck. And that's really where I think there's a lot of interest, is in understanding the discrepancies between the countries which are accelerating and rocketing, like Kenya and Nigeria, like Tanzania, uh, like Angola, and some of the others, which still grapple with a lot of the conflict and the poverty that uh, characterized the whole of the continent for so many years. So when we talk about Africa, we're really talking about many different Africas, 54 different countries, 54 different economies, societies, ethnic makeups, and lots of lots of dynamism. So just to, to come back quickly to the, the service part, um, as people have evolved how they engage with the continent, we've evolved our service offering. We started as a pure PR firm to tell Africa's success stories, but we've noticed that people don't need to be told why to invest in Africa anymore. It's much more how to invest. So we've built out a political intelligence and risk advisory capability so that we can get in with our clients at the C-suite, reporting often directly to um, the, the CEO as the chief risk officer and the chief reputation officer, because we believe that risk and reputation are key to doing good business in Africa. There's a lot more transparency, there's a lot more scrutiny, and there's one billion people hungry for progress that will hold people increasingly to account, whether that's governments or business. Thank you, uh, Natalie. Nicola, uh, we've heard that uh, Africa is witnessing really a very ro robust economic growth. How does that impact uh, our business? Um, I can only speak on behalf of South Africa, and yeah. I, I keep on saying to my clients, remember, um, Africa is a continent, not a country. But South Africa is the second um, largest economy in South Africa, and we represent about 24% of the continent's GDP. And it's a very well-established economy, so a lot of multinationals have used South Africa as a springboard into the rest of the continent. Good banking and financial infrastructure, good telecoms, and in fact, over the last year, we've seen a lot of global communication groups sniffing around in South Africa and buying up PR, digital, and social media companies, um, getting multiples up to 8.5 uh, price earnings multiple. So there's a keen interest in using South Africa as a base into sub-Saharan Africa. 
which are the markets uh, which are growing the fastest? And I think it's a question for, for all of you. And I understand uh, Kenya is one of the markets which has been very successful in the, in the last years and sort of everybody's flocking to Nairobi. Absolutely. Um, Kenya is one of the fastest growing markets in East Africa. Uh, and indeed in Africa, I think it's one of the four fastest growing markets, South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, and then Kenya. And this is driven by a couple of factors. One, I think it's the people, uh, very innovative people, highly educated, very high literacy levels. I think one of the highest in Africa, probably 70% of the people are conversant in English and have basic uh, education. And then also the geographic positioning, it's a gateway into East Africa and indeed most of Africa. It's sort of central between South and North Africa and very close to Europe uh, with also advanced infrastructure. Um, we have good railways, good airlines, good roads that access most of uh, East Africa, and, and of course, telecommunication development. We have by far, I think, one of the highest uh, <coughs> penetration rates of telecommunications, which has leapfrogged uh, Africa much more than many parts of the world. So most people today, one in every two Kenyans, has access to a mobile phone. And it's their, this is before they even have access to power or to health services. So you can imagine, and with data, everybody's on internet, and they don't even have lights in their houses. So this just opens up a whole new industry of people. And I think uh, this has driven the, and again, what's happening in the region is a discovery of natural resources. There's oil in Kenya, oil in Uganda, coal, mining, gas in Tanzania. This has just made it very attractive. And of course, lastly, I think the government of the day, Kenya was one of the first countries in Africa to, uh, to go democratic in our government. And so now this has made it very liberal. So we have freedom of press. Um, this just makes our industry so much more open, so much more competitive. We have a pretty advanced capital market. Um, so we have a lot of cross-listing now, a lot of companies uh, across Africa and from Europe. Again, this makes, gives new industry, new opportunities for financial communication, for investor communication, Again, development sector is huge. We have a lot of the donors staying there, um, camp housed in Nairobi. So we have a huge market for development uh, communications with the UN, the bilateral donors. So this is pretty advanced. But even though we're looking at Nairobi or Kenya with this, we look at East Africa, just going crossing border to South Sudan or to Uganda or Tanzania, this, the case begins to change. The markets may not be as open, uh, yet you're looking at the regional. You may, not, you may not have an advanced capital market, so you cannot advance or provide the same services within the same region, even though you're housed in Nairobi. We've talked about uh, the, the major hubs, and maybe you have a, a helicopter view because you cover all of Africa. Um, are there other interesting markets? I understand you've been active in Somalia for all places. Yeah, I, I don't think many people would um, expect me to say that we have the third biggest team on the continent in uh, Mogadishu. So Lagos and Nairobi are our biggest hubs, but we've recently taken on a really interesting mandate um, to support the African Union and the United Nations in Somalia. And I, I think it, it also touches on one of the points that I think is interesting about Africa is that the pace of, of leapfrogging, whether it's technology, whether it's be best practice, Africans are hungry, and not because in the way that you'd think. It's really thirst for, for the cutting edge, thirst for the best in class. Um, and it means that we're able to leapfrog our services right to, to really innovative things. So we're doing some work on information operations, countering terrorist narratives, and starting to build support for the stabilization process. So it's pretty sophisticated. It's um, political and social communication and it's blending a, a range of, of techniques, whether it's um, digital, whether it's journalism, whether it's um, content creation, and blending it through the channels and distributing it in a country which has no um, established channel. Somalia is quite a, a, a unique operating environment. When we talk about Africa, and this is the case here, we always and mostly talk about sub-Saharan Africa, but we should not forget about Northern Africa, we just heard about Egypt, which is growing. There is another economy which is also growing quite quite strongly, and which is a point of entry specifically for European uh, companies uh, into into Africa, and that's Morocco. Um, and we have uh, here Kamal Taibi of Strateus, in, uh, who is active in, based in Morocco. So. 
uh, we should not forget the importance also of so, some of the northern African uh, countries who are bridging, I would say, a bit the gap between Europe and, and Africa. Now, uh, Yomi, what are the main challenges you see in, uh, in Africa and impacting uh, your, your business? Um, thank you very much, Joe. The first one would be the image of Africa. Uh, a lot of us have stereotypes about Africa. Uh, what we see on media, especially the Western media, about strife, about um, all kinds of challenges. Yes, we do have those challenges, but Africa is w the fastest growing continent on this world. Uh, and there are a lot of opportunities there. Uh, and I think uh, it's been mentioned earlier that Africa is not homogeneous. It's not one. So once we're able to get past the image of Africa, you see that there's a lot of opportunity that exists there. Um, two, some of the problems that have been mentioned here is talent and capacity. Um, if you have that kind of challenge in Europe, you have it in America, you can imagine what probably happens in Africa. Uh, basically, what has been, traditionally, we have institutions that teach communication, uh, including public relations, for instance, Nigeria, where I come from, have, we have the Nigerian Institute of Public Relations, or at the continental level, the African Public Relations Association, which I represent, um, we find that a lot of the talents that are being developed, uh, when they are nurtured up to a certain extent, the other people come, uh, people from the client side, come and snatch away the talent. So since we're talking to consultants here, uh, a lot of those talents which you nurture, you pick them up, uh, and then when you're about to start reaping from your work, the client comes in uh, and then snaps off that uh, person. Third will be the poor value appreciation of the work we do. And this is also tied into the fact that um, our measurement and evaluation is not exact. So we cannot exactly say what we bring to the table. So generally, when there's going to be a reduction in uh, uh, budget, uh, they turn to us first. We are the ones that our budget cost cut by half, cut by quarter, cut by 75%, and so on. Uh, in our business, a lot of times we find out that um, somebody like a multinational sends a budget to Nigeria and says, um, oh, guess what? We've, you know, we've carved it up and we've given you $3,000. Go and work with $3,000 for uh, six months. And we ask ourselves, what can we possibly do with $3,000? Um, it's also the ability, inability for us to rethink our business. And I've seen that uh, in the room here. Uh, we need to rethink public relations. The very first presentation we had today by Fred said a lot about that. Uh, and I think subsequent presentations have also followed in that line. So we've not been able to also uh, do that. Then finally, I'll talk about infrastructural development. Uh, Africa is still lacking behind in that regard. Uh, we talk about internet penetration. We talk about ability to move from one region to another, from one country to another, from Nigeria to Kenya to South Africa. It's still a bit uh, uh, hampered, or it's a lot hampered. And all those things are having impact on our business in Africa. And what about political risks? Well, I should mention that. Uh, definitely, as you probably all know, uh, being the youngest continent, uh, democracy uh, is younger in Africa than in most other parts of the world. Um, so in that regard, we do have challenges. Um, uh, this, had been, this has been addressed, both at the, especially at the African Union level, uh, so that we don't have infrequent change or frequent change in government. Uh, but what we do have is inconsistency sometimes in policy and regulation, which affects, uh, take for instance, um, in, in my country, for instance, there's a new regulation about foreign exchange, and we're discussing a bit of that uh, over drinks last night. Uh, so before, you could put money on a card, and you could come here. Uh, I had that challenge coming in here because my, com my country comes up to say, we need to tighten things up. So you can put money on cards or something like that. Uh, and then, so do you have to travel with cash? Uh, can you use your card? So there, there are challenges in terms of policy consistency. But over and above all, uh, there's still the opportunities are a lot more than the challenges. Yes, on, on the 
on the political risk. Um, we get a lot of queries from um, international PR professionals who want to come work in South Africa, mainly because the weather is glorious. Um, but what we find is that our government has released a black economic empowerment charter. So we get a point system on whether um, how many black people we employ from previously disadvantaged um, communities. We can't pitch for any government or big multinational work if we don't score above a certain level, if you don't have a level one or two, and you actually get penalized for, em for employing white people. So it's very difficult for the PR industry when you're trying to retain black talent because they go to our clients, but also to get um, uh, senior talent from the outside trying to upskill what's happening in our industry. So a lot of constraints in doing good creative work um, because it's hard to hold on to quality people. Yes, sure. I just wanted to add that there's also opportunity in the political risk side. So we built out the political risk advisory and intelligence part of our business by understanding that that complexity, that volatility, the unpredictability, actually a lot of people need to grapple with it. It's not just a challenge for our business, it's a challenge for everybody. And so we've oriented our business model to be able to advise on how to navigate those risks and we've built out uh, a public affairs capability which we can inform by deeper intelligence so that we can make sure that we understand the drivers behind what can seem like quite arbitrary and quite strange changes at short notice but there's usually a logic you just have to decode it to understand what's really behind the, um, the decision. Thank you. Janet, uh, what is the main PR offering in, in Africa? How does it look like? What, what kind of services are your clients looking for and do you see an evolution in, in that? Thank you. Um, let me look at it from the context of East Africa. Yeah. Um, PR services, I think, are evolving. Um, there's room for all the services. You do have, and this is based on how advanced the country is, uh, based on the government for one, how open and liberal the policies and systems are. If you have freedom of press, then you will have uh, pretty need, high needs of sophisticated and specialization in PR. Um, also look at the industry, because we're also liberalizing a lot of the sectors. So like telecoms has a couple of players, so there'll be intense competition there. There's intense need for education for customers and clients, so that brings a whole new uh, opportunity for PR to educate the clients, to change perception, to change behavior. Uh, again, there are other sectors, like when you look at um, energy. Energy is new and it's growing. There's a lot of opportunity for public policy, for lobbying, for government relations, uh, because it's a sector that's evolving and it's unknown. So I think there are huge opportunities. In terms of what services there is, you still have them. What's happening also in our stock market is the young, sort of mid-sized companies are beginning to be to get, raise money publicly on the stock exchange, so they are just coming into listing. And this now changes the scope and the need of their services. Reputation becomes important, sustainability becomes important. So suddenly new opportunities and new markets are being opened just by this policy change, so they can now become more public and raise money. So I think there's a whole raft of uh, need for services. Again, it's looking at horses for courses, uh, different markets, if you just cross the border, to Rwanda or Burundi, uh, they still have very controlled media, maybe one main media in-house, so the need for the services is a lot more toned down yeah. than you'd have uh, in a bigger market. Yeah. Another question for you, because I know your background is also in, in technology. Is technological change res reshaping communication in Africa? Absolutely. Um, technological change has changed a lot, uh, and not just communication, but actually virtually every sector yeah. in East Africa. As I mentioned earlier, um, technology has come and sort of leapfrogged from people who had absolutely no communication, no roads, no railways, yeah. no access to major towns, suddenly now are on the phone, have a mobile phone, and have access to the internet uh, even before they have power. So when you look at some of the big industries that have come through, is say, I don't know if you've heard of M-Pesa, which is perhaps the greatest innovation coming out of Nairobi or East Africa, is most people for the first time in their lives are able to have a bank account on their phones. Uh, traditionally, they had no access to any bank or any banking solution. So now they have it on their phones. They can send money and receive money. Yeah. But this has created new opportunities. So suddenly we have power being provided because now I can pay for power from my mobile phone. So the largest solar industry, um, M-Copper Solar, is now running on the backdrop of telecommunications network. Yeah. Same thing with education. 
And this, of course, has changed our industry. This is also the way people first get their information. Traditionally, they waited for the news. At 7 o'clock, they all gathered in a community, and that's what they had. Yeah. Today, everybody in rural areas who's never been to the town yeah. is already accessing information on their Twitter or Facebook account. So it's changed our industry. I mean, many of you might know of the current world champion in javelin is a Kenyan called Julius Yego, who trained himself from rural Kenya on YouTube, has never had access to a coach, and is currently the world champion. Yeah. Uh, this is technology, and it's changing. So obviously for our industry as well, it's had a huge impact. Yeah. Um, people are learning, you know, reading, accessing course materials on their uh, phones, yeah. different from what traditional media as we knew it. Yeah. So understand mobile, mobile is really the, the key communication uh, medium. But what about internet? What's the penetration of internet uh, versus uh, and country by country? Is that very different? Um, yes, internet is not as high, of course, as mobile, but it is pretty high. As, uh, I think last statistics we had about 10 million people in Kenya, over 45 million, out of a population of 45 million who have access, who access their internet on a daily basis, uh, which is pretty high. But it's all on mobile. The penetration of desktop or laptop computers is virtually less than 1%. So it's all on mobile, so it's largely mobile content. Uh, and of course, this limits how much people can read or how much information they do have. Um, and this, this changes as you go, as you spread out the region, uh, because the fiber optic has not spread into hinterland Africa. It's still largely around the coast, so the countries along the shores yeah. are the ones which will have high ne connectivity. As you go inside, the rates drop drastically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about content, Nicola? Because we've been talking about um, the, the, the ways of communicating, but how do you go about content? How local does you need to, to, to be? Um, can you say something about that? So just once again, back to South Africa, we've got 11 official languages, although everyone speaks English. Um, we recently launched Burger King in South Africa. They've been in the market for two years. And we, we had a look at their global messaging and what they do in other countries. But even the two main cities in South Africa, Cape Town and Johannesburg, we followed a completely different approach. Um, the market thinks differently. They act differently. Cape Town is very hipster, influencer-driven where Johannesburg has got a hip-hop culture, and we have to tap into the insights and adapt our content accordingly. And we often get approaches from the PNGs and the Unilevers, the big multinationals who want to take one message and use that across sub-Saharan Africa, and it doesn't work. Um, and that's why PR in, in South Africa or in Africa is more expensive, because you have to adapt those messages according to your insights <coughs> and according to your audiences. How native do, do you need to, to go? Is that, uh, because it must be quite, quite complex to keep the message um, across, across whole Africa, but at the same time to be quite, quite native and how? We, we tend to stick to English. It just makes it easier. Um, it also depends on your client's budget. If they really have a big budget and they want to reach rural South Africa, you need to go in terms of the vernacular language. Um, but it's about adapting that message so it resonates with your audience. But we try and stick to English. It becomes yeah. too expensive yeah. if you have to translate into all the official languages. Yeah. But a campaign we would, um, the type of work we would do in South Africa would be different to what we would do in Botswana or in Mozambique yeah. or Namibia. You would yeah. adapt that once again for that particular yeah. country yeah. and yeah. audience. Yeah. Well, you just mentioned budgets. What are budgets uh, like in, in Africa? Are this different, different from one country to the other? Good question. I think, A, yes, they're different from one country to another, but I think they've also changed over the past few years. Um, they started with, I think Yomi mentioned, um, with people saying they had $3,000, what can you do in Africa? Um, people don't tend to ask us that so much anymore. And also, over the past few years, we've moved away from pitching for multi-country PR mandates because they do tend to be relatively low margin. And for all the reasons that Nicola's talked about, you need to be able to demonstrate value and localize. So it, it just isn't profitable to be able to, to deliver successful campaigns across multiple markets. We do our best work when we're looking at um, particularly um, transformative and complex and potentially controversial projects um, whether they're big infrastructure projects, agri-projects, 
um, could be across a range of sectors, but where the complexity is high, where the number of stakeholders that you have to engage is multiplying all the time because of political devolution, because of changes in the regulatory environment. So actually we prefer to grow with our clients by taking one country, one project in one country, and then doing such great work on that that they would then refer us within the client organization and to other clients rather than trying to get lots of countries at the beginning for the sake of it. Emerging markets are still struggling with, uh, I would say, doubt pro doubtful practices in our business. And, and Nigeria is sort of sometimes singled out uh, specifically with um, the whole issue of, of, of buying for coverage, uh, paying journalists. Uh, what about, uh, is that changing? What, is, that still, is that still the case? I heard stories about guys saying, well, why should we, why should we hire a PR firm? It's much easier to go immediately to the journalist. He has the space, and I buy him. Uh, well, yeah, that has been a problem over time, um, and that's not surprising when you have a system that doesn't have uh, a form of social security, uh, and then in also a system that is growing, and in the past, the issues of corporate governance were not so high. But all that is changing in line with global practice. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it, it, it is not strange for you to have uh, media, journalists uh, demanding or mm -hmm. expecting mm -hmm. some form of gratification mm -hmm. so that uh, they can feature your story or they can you know, give you some exposure. And then even on the um, uh, what you call traditionally paid media uh, in, 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 um, on television, there's this principle which you call LTP, let them pay. Yeah. Uh, and those have kind of eroded the value that uh, public relations brings to the table. Uh, but what has that done for us? It meant that we need to rethink our business. Uh, and I think that has been uh, brought to the fore severally today. Um, we had a client uh, a few weeks ago that when we met with her, and she said a prospective, and she said, oh, what's the difference between you and um, you know, a journalist that writes on brand, that writes on advertising, on PR, and so on. Uh, and we had a strategy session with her on Monday. And at the end of that session, when we got back to the office, I called her again and I said, do you still believe, or do you still have the doubt, or do you, are you still asking the question between what's the difference between us and the reporter? I think that the business that we run, uh, as long as we can sell the value that we have, Mm. We will overcome that challenge. Mm. And because what I say to uh, my clients, what I say to my colleagues, is that if you get, want to get something into the newspapers, it has to be news-led. Mm. If it's not news-led, then there's a challenge of you getting mm. it. Mm. So where is the news in it? Mm. If you have the news in it, then considerably you can challenge those people who are asking for money. Mm. So uh, back to your question, yes, it used to exist. Yes, there's still quite a bit of that, but in terms of technology, in terms of the value that we're bringing to the table, that is being considerably reduced. Yeah. We've talked a lot about talent, and this is a topic which comes back and back, and, and you have mentioned it also as one of the, one of the challenges um, facing the industry in Africa. What about education, Nicola? Um, yeah, it's a huge issue in South Africa. Um, there's also problems with our tertiary educations and their so-called PR certificates or PR degrees. So we've taken it on, the company is 13 years old, and since day one we've run an annual internship program. Um, different to the other PR companies, we pay our interns a really good salary, and we actually reteach them basic business skills, like how to use Excel, how to do a project management plan, how to present to a client. Um, we, they sort of go through the atmosphere university, the, um, the ones that are not successful, we only keep one. The ones that are not successful, we place with our competitors who we have a good relationship with. But what that means is that there's only a few of us that are actually upskill and there's a dying need for quality talent. Um, so yeah, we, we're looking towards our international counterparts to help and to support and look at the foundations or any other way because there's a dramatic need for quality talent and for continuous investment in talent. What about expats? Are there still opportunities for expats in Africa? <laughs> it's a good question. I started off as an expat in Africa and I think I'd say if I applied for the job that I was doing in Kenya, I moved to Kenya to set up our East Africa office about um, eight years ago, and I stayed there for, for um, quite a few years. If I applied now, I don't think I'd get the job. 
And I think that's great. I'd like to think it's because I'm, I'm better <laughs> and it's not because I'm incompetent, but it's because the government is being very aggressive in um, what they call local content, which is a theme we see across the continent, which is this fierce um, determination to build local capacity and to build talent. And it means that bringing in an expat might be a short-term solution, but it's not a long-term solution. And so a lot of work is being done to build talent from the ground up, and the programs that Nicola's talking about are, are really pivotal in, in all of that, and a lot of, of companies across Africa are doing the same. So I left by um, replacing myself with a brilliantly talented Kenyan general manager, um, and so we, I don't, I'm not needed there anymore. But there are still markets um, where there is need for expats because the, the um, level of local talent is still relatively thin. But I think over the next five years, that, that number will shrink as the local talent rises. Yeah. If you can just comment on, um, on what she's saying. It's true that uh, the market has grown so much that we may not, uh, and the government has an affirmative action, so it'll make it difficult for experts. But the market is asking for different skills. As the market, like for instance, if you take the East African market, um, there are very many generalists. But the market is evolving and there's need for specialization. So many times we find we have to be out looking for specialists in various fields. Um, and this is a constant demand. With investors, they expect certain level of service. It's, you can't always find the skills in the market. So as you develop the talent, there's need to get these experts to come in. And it's up to you to, to discuss with the government and the policy and argue your case as to why you would need these skills. Maxim, I still have two short questions or two short answers. Is that okay? Fine. Um, what is the agency, the consultancy market like in, in, in Africa? Is it major multinationals covering the whole of Africa? Is it local companies? What about emerging African companies? Um, as Secretary General of the, the African Public Relations Association, you must have a good view on how this market is, is structured and how is it evolving. Uh, basically, we all started out from being indigenous yeah. uh, businesses, uh, people who probably uh, started in the media or actually from the client side and started out consultancies and they were generalists in nature. Uh, but as the market grows bigger, and I think uh, Janet has mentioned that, we're finding out that more people are going into areas of specialization. Take for instance, Africa practice. Africa practice is more renowned for public affairs work than grand PR work. Uh, so we're finding that there's some, and I think it was Andrea that mentioned it earlier on, we're having cases of niche marketing, uh, niche business consultancies in the bigger markets of South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and what have you. Um, right now, the major networks are looking at Africa, uh, like my company represents Boston Othello in, in, in Nigeria, and that is happening across the globe. We've got H and K strategies. We've got Fleshman Hilliard. We've got Weber Shanwick. You know, a lot of uh, 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 the networks are looking at Africa, uh, but at the African level, uh, Africa Public Relations Association, we have come up with what we call the Africa PR Network, and that's a network of independents uh, that would like to bring together, so to speak, to balance out on the major networks. Uh, in that way, if you've got a business. Uh, perhaps that business goes to Atmosphere, and they're not a global network, quote and unquote, and they can source from that pool partners that they would work in in the different markets across the African scale. So uh, the, model, the model is still evolving mm. for Africa, uh, but I see uh, in future that we're going to have a lot of specialization uh, and niche marketing. Okay. Uh, just last question, when we prepared this, um, this panel, we talked about clients, who are the type of clients, and, and so on. It was quite interesting to see that donors are really a, a large and a major category of clients, which, of course, we, we, we do not have. Can somebody comment on that? Yeah. Okay. Short. Okay. Short okay. answer. Donors, um, donors are a huge part of our work, because a lot of the work that we find is... Um, purpose-driven marketing. I think uh, I talked about it earlier this morning. So you find there's a lot of room for education. So a lot of the projects and a lot of uh, information that is going into the market, education, highlighting new areas, new needs, is coming from the donor work. And again, being anchored in East Africa, there's, they're sparring a lot of the economic growth that we have. So like, and power is largely funded by donors. 
um, education is still funded by donors, and new areas of education. So you do find they probably contribute to about 30% of uh, the media spend in general. Okay, thank you so much, Janet. We're going to stop here. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists to do this panel in 30 minutes instead of 45. Uh, but I had Maxim looking at me, so we're finishing here. Thank you for your attention, and um, those, the, the panelists will be here for the two days, so if you have questions, don't hesitate to, to, to ask them, including to Kamal, as far as Morocco is concerned. Thank you so much. <laughs>